Um, where and when were you born? So I was born in Manchester, England, um, on the 2nd of October 2001. That makes me 18. And uh, uh, you said October? Yeah. So that um, also makes you a Libra? I'm a Libra, yeah. And do you identify with liking balance and justice and refinement and order? Oh, definitely, because I feel like there has to be a balance in the world, otherwise it'll just go into chaos. So if uh, one group has too much power, then the other group's going to feel the consequences of that and suffer, and that's kind of what's happening now. Mm -hmm. um, what other words would you use to describe you for someone who doesn't know you? Oh, it's very hard to describe like your whole self as three words. Yeah. Um, I probably describe myself as uh, determined, um, probably fearless, going against these like big companies that have all the money and the power. And uh, oh, it is really hard. Uh, probably. Determined, fearless, and unstoppable. All right. Definitely. All yeah. right. Um, do you have siblings? Yeah, I have a brother and a sister. What's your birth order in the three? Um, so I'm the oldest, and then it's my little sister. There's six years between us, and then it's my little brother, and there's nine years between me and him. And are they interested in climate activism, or do they think it's just Charlotte's thing? Um, uh, well, it's definitely my thing in the family. It's like my little quirky thing. Um, I mean, my sister, she's uh, done some actions with me, like gone out. Uh, we did like a dye-in um, at um, uh, the Ardale Centre in Manchester. And so that was like really cool to bring her and like bring her into my world, basically. Um, but my brother kind of just like brushes it off and he's like, oh, my sister does stuff like that. <laughs> and my sister, my sister, like, um, boasts about it in school. She's like, my sister does all this stuff with the climate change stuff. So it's very much like it's my thing. And, like, we all have our own little things in the house, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And are you in uni now or are you still in secondary school? Um, so... Basically, because you have a different uh, schooling system, so I'm in uh, 6-1 college, which is the bit just after high school, um, but just before university. So I'm kind of like I'm kind of like a senior in high school in America. Yeah. And that that sixth year is um, real academic focus, so a lot of people don't do it. Is that it's kind of like a pre-college kind of a study? Yeah. Yeah, basically, and it's very much in depth. So you pick three subjects, and then you study them in so much depth. And I picked all essay subjects, so I'm writing essays upon essays about random stuff. Yeah. So what what are the three topics that you picked? So I picked sociology, um, history, and English literature. Hmm. And where would your dream uni be? Uh, Lancaster University. Yeah, that, that's the dream, that's the goal to get into it. Why Lancaster? Oh, it's just, it's such a nice place, um, so it's quite quaint, and uh, the university actually does a lot of things with the environment, and they have like, um, it's like just all about the environment, so they have campaigns going out and things like that to recycle more and everything, and I really just clicked with that when I went to visit it. Mm. Um, and what would you do? You say major, or you you people Brits usually say, "What did you study in university?" Right? What? Yeah. So it's kind of like you get a degree in it, but uh, Lancaster does have major and minors, so I understand like that concept. And what would would you do? Environmental science, or what? What would you study? Um, I'm going to hopefully study criminology and sociology. So I'm really interested in the green crime section of uh, the sociology. Uh, so criminology seemed like the best bet for me. So I'm going to hopefully specialise in uh, female crime involvement and green crimes and things like that, just like really in depth. Like that's what I find interesting. So is green crime polluters who harm the environment and dump waste into rivers and that kind of thing? Yeah, so they're the big capitalist companies who don't 
don't see justice because they have all the money and all the power. So polluters into lake and um, dumping plastic in ocean, things like that. Mm. Um, I'm just thinking of the Dutch teenager who went diving in Greece, I think, and he was appalled by all the plastic. So he mm -hmm. stayed out of uni to invent, you uh, you know who I'm talking about, to invent yeah, yeah. a device to to gather up the plastic. Oh, of course, yeah. That I don't know how far that's progressed, but that, that was really amazing that he did that. Mm -hmm. I, um, was, I, was, I was that smart. <laughs> well, yeah, I think he's an engineering type. Um, mm -hmm. But you, we each do our own contribution. So how did you um, get aware of the climate crisis and decide, whoa, I've got to do something about this? Well, my chemistry teacher taught me about it, it must have been two years ago, so when I was like 16, doing my GCSEs, my, my exams in, uh, at the end of high school. So we basically did a topic on it, and I was like, oh, this, this is kind of serious, but it wasn't a threat. Like, I didn't see it as a threat. I was like, this is serious. Obviously, people are going to be doing stuff about it. Um, the government's probably got it under control. And then I saw, a year later, I saw a post um, on Facebook by a woman named Jenny, who's honestly amazing. Um, she organised the first two youth strikes in Manchester before I took over. Uh, with some other uh, young people and she wrote a post about uh, the youth strike in February uh, 2019 um, about it and I said oh I'm gonna go to that I'm gonna write a speech I'm gonna say stuff about it and the more I researched about it for my speech the more upset I became mm -hmm. and the more disappointed I came and the more angry I came and I funneled all those emotions into the youth strikes and that's kind of how I got more involved. And by the April Youth Strike, I was organizing them with all the young people and I've just not stopped. Mm, that's exciting. Um, do your parents worry about you being on the street in a strike or are they just like, go for it, girl? Um, well, my, my mom is definitely, she, whenever I leave the house to go and do a strike, she always goes, don't get arrested. <laughs> It's it's more of a jokey kind of manner though than like a serious one, um, because we do work so closely with the police and it's actually my job to work with the police and uh, try and get them to just facilitate us and let's do what we want to do. But it's it's very like um, please be careful. But I'm gonna be joking with you because I know you're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> uh, but they are so supportive of what I do and. My dad says it makes me have a bit about me, which basically means I've got something to me, um, which is really nice. But they're they're so they're so good, yeah. Oh, nice. So, do you strike every Friday from school, or do you mostly go on the streets for the big international strikes? So I mostly go, we go out monthly in the UK, so we organise monthly youth strikes and we tend to make the international ones uh, big and we promote them really, just drilling it into everyone. This is an international one, we've got to be comparing to places like New York and Sydney and all these other places and we've got to show solidarity with them and what they're going through. Uh, but yeah, we strike monthly and we do have a group that strikes every single week. And are you part of that group, the weekly group? So I try and go out as much as I can, uh, but school and A-levels is very much tough at the moment. But as soon as I'm done with them, I will be out every single week just doing my part to spread the word about what we're doing. And as a kind of an end note, GSEs, you take them before the A-levels, are they like prep for A-levels or what's the relationship between the two? So GCSEs is where you study like all the subjects. You do get to pick certain ones. So you have to take English, you have to take biology, chemistry and physics. You have to take maths. You have to take language, so I took French. You have to take PE. Um, and then you get to pick three options. So I picked drama, media studies, and history. Uh, you can pick other subjects like geography, etc. 
and then you do them and uh, so they're all essay based basically apart from like the maths and the sciences and then you after that you get to leave high school so when you're 16 you can leave education and do an apprentice or a BTEC which is more of a practical kind of qualification or you can go and do grey levels and then you go off to uni and do a degree so it's it's very um essay based here well I think America's quite a multi-choice isn't it in the college entrance exams are yeah mostly multiple choice and then some essay it's yeah Um, you can do it really fast I wish it was multiple choice there (laughs) I'm writing like 10 page essays just for one question to merely get a B Uh, and then can you do the essay on your own or you go to a hall and write it with a proctor and all that well we're in a we're in a big hall and we we don't have any prompts we don't have any cue cards or flashcards or anything like that it's very much like you have to rely on your memory and you just have to take it all in and it's very strict there's uh invigilators that come in so there are people we don't know and they come and do and watch us do our exams make sure there's no cheating and then they get sent off to uh, the exam markers who we don't know they don't know us and they mark it then they send it back to the exam boards and everything like that so yeah it's a very strict process and how many team. hours do they give you for the, all of them together GCSEs all together. well each exam is different oh. so for uh, English literature I usually get two and a half hours per exam So I do two English exams, so that's five hours uh, for that one, then two and a half hours for each history, so that's five hours for that, and then two hours per sociology, so that's about six hours for that. So it's all like dependent on what GCSE or what A-level exam you're taking, depends on what amount of time you get. And do they spread them out over different days, or is it all compacted? Um, they try and spread it out as best as possible. Uh, I just did my mock exams, which is pre-exams uh, for my real ones, and they were all like bunched up into a few couple of uh, days. And I was like stressing because I had six is six hours of exams in one day. I was like, oh. your hand gets it, tired. <laughs> yeah, I was. I couldn't move my hand. I was like, I'm not coming in tomorrow. <laughs> ah, interesting. Um, so when you are organizing locally do you work with a local Fridays for Future group or how, what's the organizational structure So we uh we some we it's kind of hard to explain but basically we talk to Fridays for Future a little bit but they're usually there anyways so we don't really have much contact with them uh we have like a WhatsApp group and a Slack going and we discuss, right, who's going to do this job? Who's going to do that job? Okay, so I'll do police liaison. You can do the graphics for the poster that we're going to use. Who's going to organise the speakers? It's very much just a divvy up of tasks. And then we have um, a Zoom meeting, which is like a Skype meeting, about, right, okay, we've got this. We're going to be doing it. And X, Y, and Z needs to be done. And we sometimes talk to Extinction Rebellion and Extinction Rebellion Youth Manchester. Um, and they usually come and support us. So we, at, last, at the last strike, we have the samba band going, which is like really good to keep morale up. And they usually bring their signs and everything. So it's good to have that kind of network going as well. And they usually help us with speakers and stuff like that and transport, which is really helpful. And is there a, a, what's the name of the group that you work with? It's not Fridays so, for Future, it's not XR. No. So we call ourselves the You Strike for Climate Movement uh, in the UK. And then that's kind of, we're kind of, the head of that is UK Student Climate Network, which is a network of all the different groups. Well, we try as best as we can. Mm-hmm. And so the, the youth strike, is is a UK wide group, and then there's a Manchester group that you're involved with. How how do you coordinate nationally with Youth Strike, and and then tangentially with Fridays for Future and XR? 
um, we're we're still figuring it out. There's still some kinks in the um, in the works for working with other groups, but we have a Slack going for everyone in the UK SEN or anyone that wants to be in UK SEN. Um, and that's like, okay, so what date do we want the national strikes? Okay, so the international strikes this date. Uh, previous month we can have it this day to kind of coincide with that and give us a bit more planning time so there's like a slack basically with loads of different threads and branches going off there organizing national events mm -hmm. and from your observation locally and nationally what percent are female of the organizers the activists there is a substantial amount of female um, people, well girls involved in it. And I was looking at the stats for the Instagram because I managed the social media for Manchester and it was 75% or 85% were women and the rest were male. I, I just find that really interesting. That yeah. was on the Instagram strike group? Um, so it's on the followers. It's based on the followers um, of like what gender they are and the majority is girls that follow which is kind of I was a bit taken aback to begin with because I was like oh I thought we were dead inclusive and stuff but then I see loads of boys at the strikes as well so I think oh okay but a lot of them are girls and in our group on our organizing group the majority are women and strong female uh, figures that are organizing the strikes and I think that's great. Um, that's typical. <clears throat> I mean it's not it's not unusual that it's the norm. So why do you think that is? Why are more young women organizing than men? I think because women are oppressed so much in the society already and they I think they recognize the oppression that the world's actually going through and they kind of make a parallel in their mind subconsciously and think, right, they're, get, they're being oppressed, the environment's being oppressed, I'm being oppressed. I might not be able to speak about my own struggles, but I'll be able to speak about the environment. Because they might not be able to voice what the patriarchy means to them and what it's doing to them, because not many girls know that they are being oppressed. But they see the environment being oppressed and being taken advantage of so they take out that anger on the environment, well, not on the environment, on the organizations destroying the environment. Right. So do you, are you comfortable with the label feminist? Oh, definitely. I'm 100% a feminist. I think that people are scared of the word because there are a few radical feminists that kind of ruin the word, but it literally just means equality for all. And... I think everyone should be a feminist. It, it's equality for all. Why wouldn't you want somebody to have the same opportunities as you? Like, it's just bizarre to me that people don't think that way. Right. Um, one of the people that I interviewed said one of the gender influencing factors is in high school, in secondary school, it's not cool for guys to be activists. It's more cool for girls to be activists. I guess for guys, if you're cool, you'll be in a band or be a football player or something. Do you, do you, does that resonate with you at all in terms of your experience in high school or not? Well, I didn't really know what the word activist meant in high school, but I feel like it's more of a hippie kind of like, ooh, flower power. I feel think people associate it that with activists and climate activists especially which isn't true like at all like we're not just ditching school to smoke weed and not everything like that we're, we're not doing that um but people associate with that and i think boys definitely associate with that oh i don't want to be seen as that because it will make me seem gay or whatever and it doesn't it just makes it seem like you care about the environment and the world that you live in so, uh -huh. yeah. Um, when you have a monthly strike, what's a typical turnout? How many people would be on the street or in front of the municipal building or wherever you do it? It really depends on the weather 
because we live in Manchester, it's very, um, you don't know what you're going to get, if you're going to get rain, if you're going to get sunshine, if you're going to get hailstone. So it's really dependent on the weather. But we do get quite a substantial amount of people. I think at the last one we had about 200 people, 200, 300 people show up, and that was in February. Uh, and the most we've had is like 3,000, which wow. was in September, which was mind-blowing. And me and this other girl, Emma, who's my like partner in climate justice, we were like freaking out, like, I can't believe we've organised this, this many people. But we do get a good amount of people, which is always nice to see when people come and show their support. Um, what kind of action do you ask the people who come to take? Because I, if, informing people, I, I think, is one prong. But then what, what can we do about it? What action do you suggest? Well, at the Youth Rights, we don't force anyone to... Uh, take action that they don't want to do. So at the youth strikes, we usually do some chanting. We have people on the speakers and stuff, stuff like that. And then we go marching and usually do a dying somewhere um, if the weather's not too bad. But I definitely say just talking about it is like one of the best forms of of getting the word out. Just talking about it, even if it's just. Oh, have you seen on the news that this has happened in Australia with the bushfires? Have you seen the California fires? Just the little things, just retweeting stuff on Twitter and sharing stuff on Facebook. It's just so imperative to the movement and to the worldwide movement of climate justice. What, what are some of the popular chants or slogans? I like There's No Planet B. That I do like with me. There's No Planet B. Uh, one of my favourites, which every single strike someone gets me to chant, is Power to the People, which is a, a call and response. So it's Power to the People, People Got the Power, Tell Me Can You Hear It, Get Stronger by the Hour, Power, Power, People, 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 Power, Power, Power to the People. And that's one of my favourites because it just, it, you get a really sense of unity and community like within that chant. Uh, we have a few more. We've got uh, what do we want? Climate justice. When do we want it now? Yeah. Um, and I like the um, whose planet, and it's our planet. I like that one as well. I like the call and response ones because mm -hmm. uh, it really just it shows the community, it shows the unity that we have, and it shows the strength that we have in numbers. Um, I would say the main emphasis overall in the movement is listen to the scientists. Don't listen to me, listen to the scientists. Greta says that, people have echoed that. What, what else are you hearing in terms of themes in recent talks you've heard at rallies or things that you are reading about online? Um, so I've heard, don't, don't listen to everything you read online because there is so much propaganda and there's so much denying deniers that want to ruin the whole movement and ruin our reputation and Greta's reputation and the scientists' reputation. And it's very much, don't believe everything you read online, listen to the sciences, join your youth strikers and just support us. Like even if it's going vegetarian for one day, going vegan for one day, wearing a green shirt to work uh, when we're striking, just to show some sort of solidarity with us. It's very much just solidarity. That's the message that's kind of getting put across. I don't know if you've seen this, but I just read that the Trump administration is trying to get scientists to say that carbon dioxide emission is good <laughs> for the planet. <laughs> I mean, you could cry or laugh. <laughs> and I'm sure the scientists won't do it, but it's amazing. This is 2020. If I don't laugh, I will start crying. Um, I mean, he said the coronavirus was a, a hoax. hoax. Um, so I don't see why people are still believing a word that comes out of his mouth. 49% approval rate. I mean, he got, he's got, it was proven that he did the crimes. And yet he still wasn't convicted. And yet people are still agreeing with him. Blows my mind. I mean, we have Boris Johnson, so I... I can't even speak, can't even speak, but it just, 
it makes me more upset than angry when politicians and businessmen do things like that because obviously they've been conditioned their entire life that they can get what they want if they really want it if they throw enough money at it they will get it and it will happen but you can't do that with the climate crisis you can't just greenwash some policies and then expect everyone to be happy and the environment to go back to the way it was that's just not how it works and it just makes me really upset that they're not taking it seriously we've got a climate emergency in the uk and yet nothing is being done they were still going to go through with a Heathrow expansion on the airport. Luckily, that got cancelled. And I was so happy when that got cancelled. But they're still not taking it seriously. They're more concerned about Brexit and everything like that. What's the point of Brexit on a dead planet? That's just the question you have to ask. Is, <clears throat> do you consider Boris Johnson a climate denier? Climate change I definitely, denier? Um, I call him a climate change uh, dodger. So he kind of skirts around the climate crisis. He, he doesn't really talk about it as much as I think he should be. But I've never heard him outrightly say the climate crisis isn't real. So I'll, I, I'd more like call him a climate dodger, definitely. What do you think worked in the Heathrow demonstrations to keep the expansion from happening? I mean, because there's obviously a lot of money involved in the expansion side, so it's pretty exciting that organizers were able to override all that moneyed interest. So what did they do? Um, well, for my knowledge, it was Extinction Rebellion that held the forefront of that, and they were protesting most days outside of Heathrow, and uh, they did petitions about it and finally it got ruled as um, you can't do it because of the climate crisis and so they were just really consistent and amazing and I was messaging my friends and I was saying look what they've done, look what they've done and my, pe my friends that like, don't care at all about this stuff or like have no interest in doing it because I'm doing it, they're like oh great I didn't even know that was happening and I'm like well, you got to listen to me sometimes. But I was, I was over the moon when they ruled it not safe, over the moon. So it was a court decision, a judicial decision? Um, I think so. Um, it definitely got ruled as uh, not safe. Uh, but I'm not sure if it went through the courts. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, we should, we should find that out. Mm. What, so Extinction Rebellion, I think of them as doing civil disobedience and making like visual statements that are attention getting. What, yeah. what, how are they different from say Fridays for Future or Student Strike? How, what's unique about them? So Extinction Rebellion definitely focus on the non-violent direct action. Um, aspect of it so they'll chain themselves to things and they'll uh, they'll just do more things to disrupt obviously we do things to disrupt like going on the roads and stuff like that but they'll do it for extended amount of times um, so in Manchester in August they basically shut down about five roads and just set up camp and we had like um, just a kind of like uh, a party kind of situation with loads of tents and things going on. Festival. And, uh, vegan food. Yeah, like a festival. Um, and they're very much like bigger, more things, and we're more consistent things. We're going to keep on going and keep on, um, keep on uh, striking. striking. Yeah. Um, why did they pick those particular roads? And weren't some people ticked off because they couldn't go on the roads. Oh, there were so many annoyed people, but they picked those roads because um, they were they were dangerous CO2 levels on those roads, and they were like the highest in Manchester. Oh. And they were, it was actually one of the highest in the UK, uh, Deansgate, uh, where there was the road, um, the area. And it was really dangerous and the air pollution that was happening was really dangerous 
Um, so when they shut it down, the CO2 emissions just rocketed it down and people were tweeting at them saying, I actually wanted to walk home from work today. I didn't want to take the bus. I didn't want to drive my car. I decided to walk home because I could actually breathe and dean skate and I wanted to um, experience that. I could hear the birds, just the little things like that. Um, but yeah, I went to that for three out of four days they were doing it or two out of three days. And it was really amazing to see the amount of people that support us. But it's also imperative that you you look at the outsider's view because a lot of people disagreed. I was like, you ruined my day. I couldn't get where I wanted to be. But all the buses were diverted, all the cars were diverted. Nothing really happened that made an impact on people's lives apart from them complaining that, oh, it took two minutes more to get to work it took five minutes more to get to work and it was just them complaining did you spend the night like in tents or did you go Um, home at night I didn't I went home at night but a lot of people uh, stayed in tents and they had like watches going on to make sure nothing was stolen and things like that because the the tent occupations of city squares were the main tool for the 2011 um, mm-hmm. uprisings in Greece and Spain and New York and and Cairo. So I, that's interesting that they're doing tent cities again. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was really cool to say. Really cool. Do you do you um, get inspired or learn from past uprisings like the twenty eleven um, the the rebellions in the squares or is it like I have enough to do to focus on now? I mean I definitely did research on uh, other strikes and rebellions that worked because you have to learn from the past because if you don't then you're going to make the same mistakes that they did so like looking at the suffragettes in the 1910s ish striking works because they got what they wanted by protesting with their signs and everything like that and they did non-direct violent action and things like that. So yeah, they chained, them, chained themselves up to fences yeah. and stuff, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're definitely two sides of the same coin, Extinction Rebellion and the Youth Strikes and Writers Future. We're definitely, definitely on the same coin, we're just different sides of it, whereas Extinction Rebellion are more radical and we're more um, just a bit low-key, more low-key. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, since the 2011 and also with the anti-globalism movement earlier, there's been a real focus on flat organizing, non-hierarchical organizing, encouraging everyone to speak, you know, wait, signing up to speak and maybe disadvantaged people get to go first. Um, but on the other hand, if it gets too flat, it's hard to get things done and hold people responsible. So how do you find the balance between democracy and efficiency? And not having to do long, 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 long meetings where everybody's talking forever. Yeah, it, it's really hard to find the balance because obviously we're non-hierarchical, but you kind of have to have somebody leading in a way. So at the new strikes, there's, there's a few of us that like go at monthly and we definitely are like, right, okay, so we're going to just be leading it. But it's like all of you. It's everybody's you strike. But there has to be kind of a facilitator going on. And um, so I'm responsible with the police. So if anything goes wrong, they come to me and they chat to me about it. And I think that's better than them going to chat to some random person that doesn't know what's going on and maybe doesn't have the... the the language to talk to them properly and stuff like that uh, so it is it is kind of hierarchical but it's as flat as it possibly can be without chaos going to begin with with the youth strikes in Manchester people were really angry about having organizers and having people in charge of the youth strikes um, and we were getting Instagram messages like, why can't we go back to when it wasn't being organised? Well, it was being organised, but it was being organised by adults. And they passed the torch on to us in March time of last year. 
and so we had no experience organizing youth strikes so we did make a few mistakes in the first one and the second one we organized but we've kind of got to the point where people are just accepting that there's one or two of us that are going to be making sure that everyone gets to speak and that everyone gets a chance to share their opinion and things like that and at the youth strikes we make sure that the children go first so children and teenagers go first because there are some adults that want to speak and there are some adults that want to share their opinions but I always say to them this is a youth strike the youth go first the youth, youth, youth people come first the young people come first and they're always really supportive of that they're like that's fine I'll go at the end it's okay so we get nine-year-olds up and we've had I think the youngest we've had at the youth strike is about a five-month-old, six-month-old at the youth strike, and that was amazing to see. But speaking-wise, we've had, I think, the youngest five have come wow. up and spoke, and we definitely make sure we get the younger children up to speak because it takes a lot of guts. So if we can get them speaking, if we can get them to say one sentence, like, we had this girl, I think she had um, autism, and she literally came up and said um i want everyone in the world to be equal something along those lines and that was it and that was amazing because it took so much bravery for her to come up and i was like come on you can come up with me and i made sure that we were like together and everything but we definitely it's hard to be non-hierarchical because if we weren't doing that if we weren't facilitating it that girl might have not been able to speak um and we don't like to, we call ourselves the organizers but we kind of it's just it's not we're not really organizing what we are but we we're not organizing people we're just like right okay so everything's laid out you can you can take over like it, it's okay so people come up and do chants people leave the march if they want to we have the route it's fine it's just it's everybody's use strike but people have to be there to make sure it runs smoothly um, in my experience with um, organizing, two big problems are burnout and <clears throat> people get into debates as to who's the most pure politically, who's the most progressive. And it may be an example like that is flight shaming now. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, so I wondered if you think those are the main issues and if so, how you cope with them and what you'd add to the list of what you have to deal with. Um, definitely burnout and I've definitely experienced that it was the end of last year and I had the opportunity to go to the November strike I just I couldn't bring myself to get out of bed I was like I can't do this I've organized everything and yet I still do not have the strength to grow out and just facilitate it and be happy and optimistic because I'm not I can't I'm not optimistic I wasn't in November it really hit me that oh nothing's being done it was just after the election and nothing was it was like just before the election actually nothing was being done and I just couldn't deal with everything and I did burn out and it was important that I did take that break because we had November off and we had December off and then I came back even stronger in January. Burnout is definitely a thing that isn't discussed um, as much as it should be. Uh, I think it's because people want to be seen as strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. And then they burn out because they haven't talked about their feelings and they haven't talked about how hard it is to be an activist. That so much time and effort goes into organising them and going out and striking and having to deal with the nias and the abuse that we sometimes get. And people just don't talk about it. And then the other thing was uh, political debates. Um, luckily, in my group, we're pretty, pretty chill with uh, the politics and the policies. Uh, we usually agree on things um, and... Uh, this one girl or one guy, I can't remember, was like, I I booked a flight to America about a year ago and I feel really guilty about going um, and I, I can't believe it, I, I don't, I don't want to go. And we were all like, no, it's fine. Uh, when was the last time you, you went on a flight? Oh, I've not been in a flight in about 
three, four years, right, that's fine because you've cut off so many flights that you could have taken and there's no real other way to get to America. Take the flight and then it's fine. Just, we're not talking about cutting out flights completely because aeroplanes are an amazing technology and we can't just get rid of them. It's about cutting down and uh, not using them. So, like um, national flights, they're not necessary. Just take the train, it's less emissions. But going abroad, it's kind of sometimes it is kind of necessary. Um, but just dwindling down on them, just slowly cutting them out, that's all we're asking. We're not asking for everyone to, right, everyone stop flying, can't be doing it. It's very much a, just cut them out when you can. It's kind of an elitist thing to think, oh, I have connections with the friends who have a boat that's supposedly zero emissions. Most of us don't have that kind of connection. <laughs> no, we don't have that privilege to say, oh, I can just go on a boat, I can just go on a yacht and I'll be fine. <laughs> but then they guilt trip other people about it. So be, the media definitely guilt trip us. Um, and I remember one time I had like a plastic bottle and I was drinking from it and somebody like came up to me like was like, you shouldn't be drinking from that. I, I just went, well, where, what else do you want me to drink from? I don't have a water bottle with me. I, this, is a, this is all I have. And they started shaming me for drinking out of a plastic bottle. I thought you were an activist. I thought you were against this. Yes, I am against this, but I'm going to reuse this plastic bottle. It's not going to go straight in the bin. But yeah, how do you get stuff like that sometimes? So you've got to be like careful um, at the use strikes because random strangers come up to you and tell you, oh, you can't drink from a plastic bottle. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a purity thing. Um, yeah. how, how do you deal with abuse in person and online? Do you have people that troll you and criticize because they don't believe in climate change? Yeah, I've had someone um, come up to me in the street and um, was like, I don't know why they're F your hair, um, the climate's always changing and all this and talking about the ice age and just went out on a run and I just, I just walked away. I was like, I'm not dealing with you. I don't have to have your abuse failed at me. I've also had people message me on Twitter, um, you're only doing this for the fame, you're not a real activist, um, and I just went, I just, I didn't, I didn't want to reply, but I did, I was like, how much organising do you think goes into a youth strike? How much work do you think I have to catch up with in school? And they just, and then I just deleted it, I blocked them, I was like, I'm just going to let them think about it. They can't message me back, but that is something to think about because so much effort goes into it. I would more than happy be in school when I'm when I'm striking because I just think oh, I've got so much work to catch up on. I will have had an essay set or homework set or something that I need to catch up on. And like, I'm so glad climate activists exist, but they shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to be striking monthly just to get some action about the planet. We don't have time. Time is so precious nowadays. And we only have a limited amount of time left and the governments are still not taking it seriously. Or to me, what's worse is denying that it's a problem. Yeah. That's even, you could give lip service, but even worse is to say, oh, it's, it's just changing on its own. Um, roughly... Like in a typical week, how, ma how many hours a day do you average organizing online, in person, that kind of thing? Um, so because I run the social media pages, I definitely do a lot of campaigning on that. So I usually spend about um, an hour on the social medias, replying to messages, um, social medias and the email. So replying to messages and making sure that uh, people are aware of our next youth strike date and sharing information and getting people talking, just stuff like that. So I usually spend like 45 minutes to an hour average um, on that. And then when we have a Zoom meeting, which is like a Skype meeting, we usually spend an hour on that. 
Um, I usually speak to the police a week before or a couple of days before the strike, which is usually about a 20-minute conversation about everything. Um, and then in person, I usually have to go talk to my teachers about, uh, oh, I'm missing this day of school. Is that okay? What work do I need to catch up on? So I kind of count that as like organising it because I have to organise my own life. Yeah. Uh, we also sometimes have sign making and placard making events. Um, so that's like another hour or two or three hours. It does take a lot of my time up, but it's so important. So I try my best to manage everything because I have a part time job, I have schoolwork, I have climate activists, I have to have time to sleep. Oh I don't get much sleep. Um, <laughs> But everything is just so important, so I kind of do it, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't, like, if someone was to offer me, say, a million pounds today to quit activism forever, I, I wouldn't do it. I'm still, I would deny it all. I'd be like, no, I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't, I didn't do this for recognition I didn't do this for get famous as people have come up to me and said I did it because we just don't have time left and this is such an important issue and I'm so passionate about it and that's why I, I organise the strikes and that's why I strike every single month and that's why <clears throat> I um, run the social media pages that's why I um, advertise on social media that's why I um, just do all the things that I do because I'm passionate about it not because of all the amazing things that have come from it such as the opportunity to speak to people like you and to um, speak to uh, go on the radio and be on podcast like those are all amazing opportunities but it's not the sole reason why I became a climate activist. Are your main social media uh, Twitter and Instagram? We have a Twitter, we have an Instagram, and we have a Facebook page, and I manage all three of them. Obviously, I have help from other people, but I'm I'm kind of like, we kind of have like a top person in each one, and I'm kind of the top person in social media. Or you could call it coordinator. Yeah, coordinator, that's it. <laughs> it's probably better than politically than top. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of just like that. And I'm like, everyone, I kind of just like, right, okay, we need to post this on the Instagram, and anyone can do it. Yeah, coordinate it, that's better. <laughs> um, another issue besides flat um, organizing is intersectionality. So how does that theme play out in organizing there? So what, uh, what do you mean by intersectionality? Um, encompassing that we have a racist, sexist, uh, yeah. um, sexual preferences <laughs> uh, kind of biases that we want to deal with um it's hard sometimes because we live in quite a white area um well i do um in manchester is so racially diverse but i feel like we do attract more middle class white kids because they have the means they have the money to get transport into manchester and city central they um, are able to miss school because um, their grades are okay because their parents can come and help them at, with homework at school. While as working class kids and the lower class kids, they, they can't get into Manchester every single month. It's too much money. They might have to uh, go to work um, because they need money for home. They might not be able to miss schools because they'll get in trouble if they do. Um, and obviously different cultures have different... Um, opinions on uh, yes. school um, so definitely I've seen um, well I've got a couple of Asian friends and their parents are more strict about them missing school than say my mum is and my parents are they're more strict because it, obviously it's culturally and everything like that it's um, about sexuality like everyone just we just all come together we don't really care about everyone else's sexuality and i know we do have some lgbtq 
plus um, people in the group, uh, that's me included, um, and we do have them in the group, but we kind of don't acknowledge it as much. But we do try and get all the genders, all the races to get involved, but it is hard because we don't really know how to reach them sometimes, especially um, the uh, different ethnicities and people of colour. Uh, do people have pronoun preferences, like not wanting to be called she or he? Um, yeah, uh, we do have um, some people like that. Um, and I, we, don't, we really don't care. Um, they're a human being, first of all. Everyone's a human being first. Um, and if they want to be called a certain name or if they want to have certain pronouns, that's fine. Just let us know and we'll call you that. We're, we're very, I think my generation especially is very much just, oh, everyone's welcome, everyone's fine. We're so accepting. Um, and it's just great to see. And it's such a contrast from the older generations. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my friend uh, came out to me as a transgender and I just went, oh, that's really cool. Like nothing else. There was no conversation about it because I didn't. I didn't need to know their entire life story. If they're transgender, they're transgender. I'm not going to question it. I'm not going to say to them, it's just a phrase. A phase. It's just. It's just you being stupid. It's just you wanting to dress as a boy. It's cool. It's fine by me. Um, but our generation is definitely more accepting. And we've had pride flags at the youth strikes, and I'm always cheering them on. I'm like, yes, yes, you're bringing it. Um, but yeah, it is. It's different. It's just different. It started with Gen Y, the generation before you, like that's in their thirties. They're really yeah. accepting and tolerant. And then your generation Y, even more so. And I wondered if it's partly because of media, and maybe partly because there are more people of color and different preferences that are visible. What? Why do you think your generation is so? Uh, accepting of diversity? I think definitely the media has uh, a part to play in it because say 50 years ago you wouldn't see a black person on the TV screen because they wouldn't be cast, you wouldn't see an Asian person on the TV screen but now we have, obviously there's still a long way to go but there's there's so much diversity and now we have gay characters, we had um, a gay character in a Disney Pixar movie. It was a little role. Don't really cast it as gay, but we're getting there with it, and it's becoming more accepted. And I think that because we have all the access to the internet um, and everything, I, it's just we're a fingertip away from learning so much, and we do use that. Um, to our advantage and I think it's great yeah yeah the other thing that's unique about your generation I would say is how young people can be youth leaders or activists you know starting at nine or Lily who I interviewed was is 11 what do you think enables such really young people to be such strong voices in activism I think because people have made YouTube videos about uh, topics, so there's YouTube videos about the climate crisis for little kids so that they understand it. And there's an Instagram page called Climate Science um, and they just explain everything. They explain what the climate uh, crisis is and what, how the different parts work within it and what affects it. And it's definitely because People have made it simpler for kids and people have made it so that kids understand and kids have access to this information and they're able to understand it and they can understand that it's bad and if they understand that it's bad then obviously the politicians understand that it's bad. And I think kids get confused that people aren't taking action so they want to do something and they're seeing all, um, all the teenagers and everyone and all the older kids going out and they're like, I want to be like that. And I want to do that. And I think I, I think that's pretty incredible that we've come to that point where information is accessible for everybody. 
Another characteristic of your generation is, at least in the States, uh, an increasing number of especially girls who are anxious and depressed. And I wondered if you see that in the UK as well, and if you have any explanations as to why there would be an increase in anxiety and depression, especially among girls. Uh, definitely. And I think you can only see it for girls because the data shows it's there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not in boys because I've seen boys uh, be really anxious and um, go through periods of depression and stuff like that. But it's not masculine to talk about things like that. It's not masculine to um, go to a doctor and see a therapist and do things like that. And I think girls are more open with their emotion. I think that's why we've seen a rise in by them coming forward and being like, look, I'm suffering with this, I need help. Um, and I think there's been a rise uh, because the education system puts so much pressure on young people nowadays, especially in the, in the UK, I've definitely seen that. It's very much like you have to get this grade, otherwise you're not gonna get into college. Then you're not gonna get into university. It all matters. And there's so much pressure put on us. And definitely, I've gotten a, a climate anxiety, definitely. And I've gone through depressive episodes where I'm like, there's no hope. I can't, I can't do this anymore. There's no hope. And I've definitely seen a, I've seen a rise, definitely in my school. But our generation is very much, we have jokes about death all the time, um, which is... It might be, it may sound strange, but it's just how we cope. It is how we what's cope. A, when what's it's... an example? Can you think of a, a death joke that you've heard? Um, <laughs> just like, uh, literally just people saying, all right, I'm going to kill myself now. That That's it. That's the joke. And it's weird because then people will laugh and be like, oh, same. I, I'm going to do it too. But if you said that to like an older person... They'd be like, are you okay? You can't do that. It's very much, yeah. So my friends make the joke, um, oh, we're going to die of the climate crisis, brilliant. And then the coronavirus came in. I was like, oh, brilliant. So God really wants us dead now. Oh, that's great. I might just kill myself before that happens. It's just kind of that kind of dynamic that's happening. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but... Yeah, um, but that's how we cope. So definitely me, I cope through the humour and laughing at myself because um, otherwise I just start crying. Um, but I definitely laugh at myself a lot. Um, and you just have to laugh at things sometimes. Like Donald Trump saying that a uh, climate crisis is a hoax and coronavirus is a ho hoax. I have to laugh. Because otherwise I'll start crying and it just won't, I just won't stop and I'll, I, yeah, it's just not good, but yeah. Um, yeah. Some people attribute the anxiety, depression to social media pressure to look good. Oh, my friends, I saw them at this party on Instagram, I wasn't invited. Oh, look at that beautiful Photoshop photo, mm -hmm. I don't look like that. Do you think that's a part of it or not? Oh, definitely, 100%. And we can't forget that basically everything on social media is is fabricated. It's fake. It's been photoshopped. It's been edited. Like uh, the Kardashians, for example, every single one of their photos is photoshopped. And I remember being 13, 14 and uh, crying because oh, I want to look like that, but I'm never going to look like that. I'm not skinny enough. I'm not um, pretty enough. And it made me really sad because I was um, surrounded by people who I thought were better than me, uh, smarter than me, prettier than me. And Celebrity then, people, not friends, but celebrities? Uh, yeah, kind of celebrities and people in films and TV. I was like, they're all smarter than me, prettier than me. I can't believe it. And it, it made me really, really sad. And then I kind of applied it to real life. And I was like, all my friends are better than me. I can't, why are they friends with me? I can't believe it. And I think 
the media kind of made you do that, kind of made me do that, because they have such a thing of, like the Kardashians, it's like, who's the pretty Kardashian? They're comparing sisters, and it's like, well, I'll compare to myself to my friends. And it's, it's kind of like that situation, but the media and social media have definitely just made it horrendous for young people, especially um, the media um, saying, oh, you'll only be pretty if you do these five things. <laughs> and it's just to get clicks. It is just to get clicks. But young impressionable girls will click it and be like, Oh, I can't. I, I don't look like that. I, I I'm ugly. Like my little sister, um, gorgeous. But she comes home and she's like, oh, I'm really ugly. I'm like, no, you're not. You can't be saying stuff like that. Um, but then I, I'm like, I was exactly the same when I was her age. I was saying that I was ugly and I was saying I was self-deprecate myself. And I think I've definitely grown out of that because I don't really care what people think of me anymore. I mean, I've I've stood in front of 3,000 people <laughs> and spoke my mind out about the climate crisis. And, I mean, people don't care what you look like. It's the message that I want to spread more than what my appearance looks like. But it's definitely, it's definitely an issue, especially for the younger people who are seeing it for the first time. Yeah. Um, so awful. How do you cope with stage fright? Because it's uh, it's frightening to speak in front of a large group. It is terrifying <laughs> to speak in front of a large group. Um, so I did drama in high school uh, for my GCSE. And I mean, that definitely helped. But for my first climate strike in February 2019, I was like this. I was like shaking. <laughs> and... I just remember seeing a girl called MJ, who I hadn't met yet, but I saw her and she was just, she kept on my mouth, it's going to be okay, and she was cheering me on, and I just thought, you know what, She she's there for me, and she is telling me that I can do it, she's a complete stranger and she has absolute belief in me, so I can do this, I was still shaky, but I managed to get through, through what I was going to say and what I was saying, and then by probably the June one, I was like, right, everyone, this is what we're doing, this is the plan for the day, everyone called that brilliant. It's a, it's, a work, it's a work in progress. It's definitely building blocks. So I definitely started out small and I just went up and up. Sometimes I do get shaky, but it's definitely not as bad as me freezing there. And I was like, I can't do this. Um, but... Uh, the people that I met at my first strike have literally commented, you have come so far. When we first met you, you were so scared and so shy, and now you're so outspoken and determined, and you do all these things. I can't believe it. You're a totally different person. But the youth strikes have definitely changed me for the better. They've t it taught me so many skills, so many. Do you use like little cards with notes when you do public speaking, or what do you use to remind yourself what you want to say? Uh, sometimes I use like flashcards, like cue cards, uh, or I like write um, a speech on like a piece of paper and then read it off. Um, but uh, usually I do write on a piece of paper and then I kind of just go off script. I'm like, actually, I thought something else I want to say. Um, but that's kind of how I do it. And it's so much fun, like thinking about what you're going to say. It's so much fun. To organize it in a way that's effective. Um, what do you find in terms of visual images, like on Instagram or on flyers, that make the point? What what images? Do you have any in your around you there? Um, flyers? No, I don't. They're all upstairs. Um, I... I definitely like the meme ones, so people taking funny things off the internet and using them, because people, I think, have an immediate reaction, like, oh, that's a meme, I relate to that, I've seen that before on the internet, and What's then, an example of that kind of a meme? Um, so, there's a, that the shock Pikachu, oh gosh, sorry, uh, the shock Pikachu meme, so it's like, uh, just basically a picture of Pikachu with 
them out for open that. Um, and people instantly recognise it and they're like, oh, oh okay. Um, and then there's also like politi uh, politician ones. So um, we've had pictures of uh, Donald Trump. We've had pictures of Boris Johnson. Um, and I think definitely people are like, oh, they associate them. Well, at our youth strikes, because we're quite, we're quite liberal, quite left-winged um, at our youth strikes. Um, we try not to be, but I know that's the people we kind of attract. Um, they, we kind of associate them with, oh, they're not good. Climate change isn't good. But definitely them. And I love the art that comes out of the climate strikes. People like draw these amazing things on, on posters or um, they bring, uh, they do chalk drawings and it's just amazing. I'm like, absolute artist. Yeah, I love it. I love it so much. Seeing everyone's creative work because it's another outlet. It's another way of protesting. Just people using their art and their creative talent to create something so amazing that for the planet. Um, my favorite meme was the Donald Trump baby blimp. Did you see that one? <laughs> With a little cell phone in his hand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the whole of the UK was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got him. <laughs> I think he actually probably saw it when he was visiting. He probably thought it was amazing. He's like, this is amazing. He, he probably was like thinking that we were honoring him. Some sort. I love that one for some, for some reason. Um, what international groups do you look to for information about youth organizing internationally? Um, well, definitely uh, the youth strikes are international. Obviously, they go by different groups. Usually, it's Fridays for Future that they go by. We just, I don't know why we have t um, two different systems, uh, but I definitely, uh, I follow quite a few of the, um, the youth strike for climate stay in New York or LA or uh, things like that. And I follow them because it's so interesting to see what they're doing. Like, yeah, or like Australia, they're the other side of the world to me. And it's so interesting. Oh wait, they're doing it as well because when you're in one place, you think, I'm the only person doing this, and I'm the only person experiencing this. But it's just not true. Uh, um, yeah, it's just not true. And it's good to see that, and it's humbling to see that as well, because other people are, are chaining themselves to the subway or whatever, or they're marching through the streets, and you're like, yeah, we're not alone. We're not doing this alone. We're, we're all in this together. Um, do you follow the Sunrise Movement at all? I think it's probably pretty U.S. focused. Yeah, I do follow that because uh, I followed an, uh, Grace Lang, I don't know if you've met her, um, and she start, She was tweeting about it and retweeting it, so I just decided to follow it. So I do get a few of those in, but it's usually like me following the local groups that I get the most information out of. Um, is... When you think about you, um, let's say five years from now, what do you see yourself doing? Well, uh, the optimistic answer is that I don't have to be an activist anymore and I don't have to be organizing these youth strikes and I don't have to be spreading the message about this and that I'll have, we'll have achieved everything that we want to do. And, um, but... I just know that's not going to happen, so I'm quite pessimistic about it, um, and I think that I'll still be. I I'll have just finished uni, I'll be 23 I think, 23, 24, so I'll have just finished uni, and I probably still will be, active, be an activist. The dream is to work for like Greenpeace or WWF, something like that, um, yeah, that's the dream. Um, I, I never hear of youth involvement in particular in Greenpeace. Do you? Um, so I, there's like meetings for Manchester Greenpeace and I've been to one and that was really interesting. Um, but they come out and support us at every single youth strike. 
Uh, we've got one guy that dresses up as a polar bear. That's from Greenpeace. And they've always supported us. And, um, like, they've helped us with our finances. They've helped us with our strikes. Uh, so it's been really beneficial knowing them. Um, but, yeah. Um, I think we've kind of covered the main topics. Can you think of what we've left out that you would like to make sure people know about in terms of the facts or how to organize effectively or what to include yeah. in your organizing? Uh, definitely, in your organizing, definitely have a coordinator for each section because otherwise nothing will get done. And you also have to have, you also have to be bossy. If you really want to do a job, within the organising group, just tell them. Because I really wanted to do social media, so I pushed to get social media. I was like, I'm really good at um, doing all this stuff online, I really want to do it. And people were like, oh, okay, that's fine. You, re you obviously really want to do it. And also, getting involved is so easy. Just a direct message people, or email us, or email another group, and it's just so easy. And it isn't just for young people and I think that's a big misconception just because it's a youth strike doesn't mean that um older generation can't join it it is really humbling to see I'm here for my grandchild I'm here for my child um it's really humbling to see that because oh they support us that's really nice of them but it is important to know that it is youth like so you can't just come in and take over. And it's also important to note that um, it isn't just um, people that are my age, 18. There's, there's way younger. There's 13-year-olds organising strikes. And they're, they're just as important as me. And it's the people that are not organising strikes and just turn up to the strikes every single time, they're so important because without them what's the point of the organizers doing anything or the coordinators doing anything if nobody turns up so they're extra extra important the people that turn up and support us every single month and also the climate deniers they're always going to be there and you can't let them get them get you down and it's important to note that when they do say stuff to you They've probably been taught that behaviour by their parents or their teachers. And there's probably more people like them. But you can't let them break down your spirit and break down your determination. Because I've seen it be done to people. I've seen people not go to the youth strikes because they've been shouted at by a strange man or a strange woman. And then they don't feel safe and they don't want to go anymore. But they're always going to be there but we can change their minds and we're always going to be there. So I made all my friends at the youth strike. Like I've got school friends and I've got my climate friends and I've got my climate family. And I met them all there. So if you're not even friends want to go, just go because you'll make friends. I've met loads and loads and loads of people and there's just random people that know me now, which is crazy. <laughs> and just making sure that you stay safe, you stay vigil, um, and that you understand, like you research before you come to the U strike so you know what it's about. Um, and yeah, just do what you can to save the planet because it isn't, it isn't our fault. It isn't our generation's fault. It's the big corporations, the money-hungry corporations that only care about the money. They care about the money more than they care about you. So we have to make a stand. We have to stand up for ourselves and make a change. Right. What about Polluters Out? That's the newest group, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, um, I've been following them, and I'm, I'm trying to get more involved with them. And I'm, Because it's very much Americanized. It's very much an American oh. thing. Um, I'm trying to get it uh, over uh, to the UK and I'm like making inquiries and stuff like that. But I think it's amazing for what they stand for and I think it's incredible. And I really want it to come over to the UK and to other places. Um, where 
out of, polluters out of rainforests or polluters out of what? I'm not sure what the focus is. I think it's just polluters out of everywhere. So even like small lakes um, and obviously the bigger ones, the Amazon, the Congo, stuff like that, yeah. Hmm. Great. Um, I am...